So with that, I'd just like to again introduce myself. My name is Tung Shi Claremont. I am an enrolled member of the Sisseton Wahpeton Dakota from, from Sisseton, South Dakota. I reside in Colorado and I work for Grid Alternatives as the director of the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund. Uh, Grid was founded during the 2001 California, California Energy Crisis by Erica Mackey and Tim Sears, who were two engineering professionals who were implementing large scale renewable energy and energy efficiency projects for the private sector. Um, so really the idea that drove them um, was to offer free, clean electricity from the sun that should be available to everyone. Today, we have the Grid Alternatives National Tribal Program. Uh, we have a panelist by the name of Tim Willink, who will also talk about the tribal program as he is the director. Uh, but I would just like to share that since 2010, Grid has worked with tribal communities and has reached over 40 tribes uh, through their work. Um, I am managing a three-year grant, uh, again called the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund, uh, which provides new uh, funding opportunities for tribes to develop renewable energy projects. Um, using a community-centric approach, uh, we partner with the tribes to identify, develop, finance, and implement solar power projects that meet the tribal community's needs. Um, we are also supporting a growing potential of tribal leadership in energy and renewable energy generation potential on tribal lands. Um, so with that, we also provide two other programs which range from um, fellowships for individual tribal members as well as scholarship to support uh, scholarship support to tribal college and university students across Indian country. Uh, we're very proud of our program as it has uh, provided a number of significant impacts to Indian country and a number of and 27 tribal communities across the country. We have invested 3.7 million in grant funding, uh, which equates to about 1.7 megawatts of solar power and around 10.2 million in lifetime savings. We have also trained more than 127 tribal members in the process. So that is just kind of inclusive of the, the grant funding that we offer. Uh, but again, we offer the fellowships and the scholarships which have impacted more than 20 fellows and students in the past three years. So with that, I'd like to uh, pass the mic over to our first panelist, Ms. Lazana Pierce from the Department of Energy Indian Energy Office. Thank you, Tansky. Uh, first, I wanna thank Netroots Nation and Grid Alternatives for inviting me to be on the panel today. And thank you all for joining us. By way of introduction, my name is Lazana Pierce. I'm a senior engineer and the deployment supervisor for the US Department of Energy's Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs, or Office of Indian Energy for short. I have 25 years of experience in energy project development and management, and have had the pleasure and privilege of assisting tribes in developing their energy resources for more than 20 years. First under the Tribal Energy Program with DOE's Office of Indian Energy, um, with the Office of Energy Efficiency, Renewable Energy, pardon me, and more recently with DOE's Office of Indian Energy. As a deployment supervisor, I oversee the office's deployment program, which is national in scope, providing a unique perspective to energy development across all of Indian country. We serve all 574 federally recognized Indian tribes, including Alaska Native Villages, Alaska Native Village and Regional Corporations, intertribal organizations, and tribal energy development organizations. Having worked with many Indian tribes in Alaska Native Villages for more than 20 years has provided me insight into how tribal energy development has evolved over the years, and it has evolved a lot. Our mission is to maximize the development and deployment of strategic energy solutions that benefit tribal communities by providing American Indians and Alaska Natives with the knowledge, skills, and resources needed to implement successful energy solutions. 
To achieve our mission, the deployment program has instituted a three-pronged approach, including providing financial assistance through cost-shared competitive grants, tactical assistance at no charge to Indian tribes, including Alaska Native villages and tribal entities, and providing education and capacity building activities through workshops, webinars, and online curriculum. In addition, there's a wealth of information on our website at www.energy.gov forward slash Indian Energy. And I just want to highlight a few of those resources. We have an energy resource library comprised of many guides and handbooks, reports, toolkits, maps, and informational resources, an energy development resource tool that provides information for federal grants, loans, and technical assistance programs from 10 federal agencies. We also have a current funding opportunities webpage, which not only includes opportunities through the Office of Indian Energy, other DOE offices, and, and other federal agencies. Additionally, there is a renewable energy online learning curriculum, which is comprised of both the fundament of foundational courses, which include overviews of renewable energy technologies, strategic energy planning, and grid basics, as well as leadership and professional courses, which provide more in-depth information on project development and finance structures. Through our website, we also have a link to our Tribal Energy Atlas. It's the first of its kind interactive geospatial application that enables tribes to conduct their own analysis of installed energy projects and resource potential on tribal lands. If you're interested in receiving information on upcoming events, open funding opportunities, and other tribal energy related information, please consider joining our website or our email list. Um, you can subscribe just by entering your email address on our homepage at www.energy.gov forward slash Indian Energy. Next, I want to provide a little information on our technical assistance and financial assistance offered through the Office of Indian Energy. <clears throat> As I said previously, we do offer technical assistance at no charge to Indian tribes, including Alaska Native villages and other tribal entities. This technical assistance is provided through the Office of Indian Energy, other DOE offices, DOE's national laboratories, and other partnering organizations and is intended to address a specific challenge or fulfill a need that is essential to current project successful implementation. The intended result is a tangible result or specific deliverable designed to help move projects forward. Generally, technical assistance is provided in the area of technical analysis, such as modeling, expert review, transmission, utility assessment, market access, and energy efficiency reviews, or financial analysis, such as economic and market analysis, or strategic energy planning, which may include an initial resource assessment, energy options analysis, and development of a viable roadmap for development. Strategic energy planning is uh, typically involves an on-site workshop, well, prior to COVID, that is. Um, it is facilitated by tribal energy experts to assist tribal leaders, elders, and staff provide uh, to develop energy plans. Again, if you're interested in this technical assistance, uh, please complete the simple online request through our website. Again, that's www.energy.gov forward slash Indian Energy. On the financial assistance side, uh, that is provided through cost-sharing competitive grants. These funding opportunities are primarily focused on co-funding hardware installation projects for energy generation, both on the conventional or renewable side, for tribal buildings and or community scale projects, energy efficiency in tribal buildings, community energy storage, integrated energy systems for autonomous operation, microgrids, if you will, and electrification of currently unelectrified tribal buildings. In fact, we currently have an open funding opportunity announcement for energy technologies and infrastructure installation on tribal lands. This funding opportunity announcement closes August 27th. Um, however, you may want to check it out if you're interested in applying for future opportunities. As an example, um, since 2010, through similar funding opportunity announcements, DOE's Office of Indian 
Energy has invested $85 million in more than 180 tribal energy projects across the Canadian country. And you can learn more about each of those projects and the additional 128 projects funded under the Precursor Program on our online Tribal Energy Projects database. Though we're only a small program with only six federal employees, three located in DC, two in Colorado, and one in Alaska, the office has contributed to tangible results in Indian country. In fact, in fiscal year 2019 alone, the office provided funding for 27 tribal energy projects. These represent 19 megawatts of new generation in Indian country. A savings of $4 million annually for these tribal communities and savings of nearly $90 million over the life of these projects. Really cool. So if you're interested, again, check out our website, consider subscribing to our email list. I was also asked uh, to share a few examples of tribal renewable energy projects with you. Um, generally, I prefer the tribes to tell their own stories. However, I'll provide a few highlights here. Um, the first example is the installation of a 1.5 megawatt wind turbine at the Seneca Nation in New York. This was installed in 2017 with funding through the Office of Indian Energy. This turbine was a means for the nation to offset their energy costs for their members and create cost equity across their various territories. The nation soon afterwards installed two megawatts of solar and uh, went on to develop their natural gas resources. Another example of projects uh, co-funded by the office is a project led by Nana Corporation. It's an Alaska Native Corporation formed in 1971 under the Alaska Native Lands Claim Settlement Act, ANCSA. The Nana region is in the Northwest Alaska and encompasses 38,000 square miles, most of which is above the Arctic Circle. In cooperation with villages and local utilities and with funding from our office, Nana Corporation installed solar in Buckling, Deering, and Kotzebue, and went on to add batteries to those systems, allowing those villages to go diesel generators off for a portion of the years. And again, I repeat, in Alaska, above the Arctic Circle. Uh, truly amazing. As with the Seneca Nation, Nana began their exploration of renewable energy 10 years prior with some initial planning and feasibility studies. And there are a number of other solar projects successfully deployed in Alaska, including in Fort Yukon, in Hughes, and Northway Village, to name just a few. There are also many successful wind projects installed across Alaska, co-funded by the Office of Indian Energy, including wind turbines installed in Bethel to provide electricity to Bethel and Oscarville, one in Stebbins to provide power to Stebbins and St. Michael's, another in Pitkus Point, provide electricity to pick this point, uh, St. Mary's, and through a future Intertie Mountain Village. An example of solar installations in the contiguous 48 state is a one megawatt solar installation at Picaris Pueblo. It's one of the smallest of New, Me New Mexico's 19 Pueblos with only 300 members and um, only 87 of those living in the Pueblo proper. This installation helped reduce the cost of electricity for many of the Pueblo's low-income members. As with the Pueblo of Picaris, the Boba Band in California has also installed not one, but two one megawatt solar installations. And the Southern Ute um, Indian Tribe in Colorado and the Ute, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe at, um, in the Four Corners area of Colorado have each installed 1.3 one megawatt installations respectively. And the latter, with the assistance of Grid Alternatives, Tim Willing, who we'll hear from a little bit uh, later, so hopefully these examples give you uh, some sense of the many energy projects being developed by Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages across the nation. You can read more about each of these again um, and, and many more on our Tribal Energy Projects database on our website at www.energy.gov forward slash Indian Energy. And with that, um, thank you for your interest. Thank you for your time and for allowing me to share my passion with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Lizana. Very helpful information. And we'll kind of wrap it up at the end with a few comments. Uh, but I'd like to introduce 
Dr. Suzanne Singer, who is from Native Renewables. Hello, good morning. Yet, eh, Suzanne Singer, you know, she had an exact initial, not hidden, and Bashes Chain, people to a day that should shade, though she is Dashinella. Thanks for inviting me. I am Suzanne Singer. I am a member of the Navajo Nation. Uh, originally, I grew up in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, which isn't, I didn't grow up on the res, but it's pretty close by. Uh, I just kind of want to talk about some of my experiences growing up, which led to my work now. Um, I spent a lot of time at my grandparents' homes where, you know, there's a lot of space wide open, you had a lot of area to play, your nearest neighbor wasn't around for miles. Um, but growing up, I learned how to haul water, how to take care of cattle, and also had to learn how to manage my time because we didn't have electricity. So we had to finish our homework by the time the sun went down or we had to work really closely to a kerosene lamp or a propane lamp to be able to continue doing that work. And, you know, as a young person, I think I didn't realize, I thought that was pretty normal and that was a common situation. But as I've grown, grown up, I've come to realize that energy access is a huge issue in our communities. And that's part of the reason why I helped co-found Native Renewables in 2016 is to help um, electrify some of the 15,000 homes on Navajo that don't have electricity access. Um, but my, I think my interest in working with tribes actually started when I was part of the tribal energy program and I was working at Sandia National Laboratory as an intern and that program is now the, under the Office of Indian Energy. Um, but it was really exciting to get to travel to different tribal nations around the southwest, learn about their different energy development interests, how far they had gotten into different projects. And it was a real eye opener. And I think from there, I'd always wanted to continue working in my own community and use my mechanical technical expertise to help Native people. Um, so after that, I worked at Lawrence Livermore National Lab for about seven years, working on a variety of different energy projects. Um, one of the things I enjoyed was looking at energy consumption within the Navajo Nation. So doing, taking a lot of data that most of which doesn't exist, which makes it challenging, but compiling it and looking at where are our resources, which industries or sectors do they go to, like commercial, industrial, transportation, residential, and then what's the efficiency of some of those processes. Um, so the end output was what put together the Sankey diagram or flow chart, which is a high level one page energy picture of what our consumption looks like. And what was really interesting to see was, I mean, you know, I knew intuitively, but seeing on picture was how the vast difference between how much energy or electricity we're exporting and then how, what small fraction of that actually goes back into our own communities. Um, but eventually I left the lab to focus on and work full time at Native Renewables. So we are a nonprofit focused on empowering Native people and communities to help them achieve energy independence by growing the renewable power by growing the renewable energy capacity and affordable having affordable access to off-grid power so we mostly focus on off-grid solar projects um, three of the programs that we run is one is we do focus on new installs for mostly residential homes for families who don't have electricity and have probably never had electricity before for some of the elder folks um, the second focus program that we have is we do education outreach in the communities. So we offer to the local community centers or chapters one day trainings on intro to solar energy. And basically, basically our goal is to provide the community members with the tools to manage their energy consumption. Um, if you have an off grade system, you can't just plug in everything and expect it to last 20 years. So helping them understand what is what you can plug in, how long you can plug it in for, and effectively make your system last as long as possible without having to replace anything. So we also have a small maintenance program where we support community members who have systems that no longer work. So we go out to their homes and try to diagnose what's going on and give them options for what next steps are. Um, and so you can learn more about us at nativerenewables.org. Another thing uh, I wanted to mention was, because um, policy is not my strong suit, one of the interesting things I've gotten the chance to work on if, over the past few years is there's the 100% one, the network put together a policy document called the Comprehensive Building Blocks for a Regenerative and Just 100% Policy. 
So this document was designed for frontline communities if they want to develop local policies to move towards renewable energy with a with the justice framework in mind. Um, and I can put the link in the chat. And I would say one of the most innovative things, in my opinion, that we were involved with was hosting a seven week workforce training in one of our native communities. So we invited 10 participants to learn the theory, the background of solar energy, hands-on experience working with solar equipment. Um, but the intent was to be able to train them to prepare for careers in the solar industry and ideally hire in the future, be able to hire them as installers and maintenance people as we ramp up our operations. Um, so I think from the innovative part, what was new and different was we brought education to our communities, which doesn't ha happen that often. Um, we were using systems on the res for real time training, which was a lot of fun. Um, every single person that participated went every single day of the seven weeks. So that was incredible. Um, but also I think we just learned that investing in people is really important. So thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Wasik. She's from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Thank you, Takshi, and thanks to all the participants for joining us today. Um, as Takshi mentioned, I worked at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and uh, we work in support of tribal energy sovereignty through a variety of capacities. Uh, Lozana mentioned earlier a lot of the programs of the DOE Office of Indian Energy, and NREL plays one role in that work, which is performing some of the technical assistance requests that Lozana mentioned through that technical assistance program. And so, in fact, NREL has performed over 300 of those technical assistance requests over the course of almost the last 25 years. And those can focus on energy efficiency, um, you know, building level renewables, microgrid assessment, uh, available transmission capacity, et cetera. And as Lozana mentioned, there's a big focus on strategic energy planning, um, positioning tribal governments, staff, and leaders to make their own decisions about what they'd like their role to be with respect to energy usage, energy generation, and energy management. Um, I personally have worked with tribal communities in the United States on renewable energy projects since 2008. Uh, most of that work has been focused in the Southwest, and I have spent a lot of time working with both the Hopi tribe and the Navajo Nation on energy policy development and um, on implementation and development of renewable energy projects, mostly at the utility scale. And the bulk of that work has been with central government agencies, although I have also worked um, a fair amount with both villages and chapter representatives and chapter governments. And previously I had the privilege of working on water pro projects with indigenous communities and other rural communities in Bolivia for two years. And what I wanted to highlight today was just two angles uh, that NREL works on that relate to tribal sovereignty. So the first of those is renewable energy project development, you know, getting steel in the ground like um, Lizana talked about and um, Susie and talked about and Tim will be talking about in different levels. And then the policy that enables that, uh, that development to take place. At NREL, I manage a utility scale tribal renewable energy development program that has been um, in place for the last two years. And through that program, we have been able to have a team at NREL partner with a project team at each of four uh, different tribes in the lower 48. And uh, what this program does is put together the technical folks at the tribal level with some technical folks at the lab to de-risk utility scale renewable energy projects and to, um, by working through a stepwise process, make the most efficient use possible of tribal staff time in order to determine whether a project is a good idea and what are the next steps in order to move that project forward. And this program may continue. We might have additional opportunities in the 2021 to 2023 timeframe, so stay tuned. Um, one of the highlights in that project was working with the Hopi tribe. And the team at the Hopi tribe is moving forward on contracting a up to 100 megawatt 
a solar project with a development partner in the area that our team worked on with them. And then the team at the tribe is also looking at a couple other potential project sites and is moving forward um, along the development path with a potential different utility scale development partner. And uh, a lot of the work that was performed for this initiative um, such as the clarification of policy and building of relationships between tribal government offices and the, um, you know, everything as detailed as the cultural or environmental surveys that took place on the ground. All of that can translate into other economic development, which is something that's um, one of those ancillary benefits of renewable energy development and policy clarity at the tribal level. The other angle I want to talk about was the policy focus and I manage a project with the Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office in partnership with the Midwest Tribal Energy Resources Association that is addressing regulatory challenges to solar deployment on tribal land and there's a link to this project on the MTERA website and I will try to post that in the chat. Um, this project brings together state regulators electric utilities and tribal staff and over the course of three years the goal is to develop and deploy um, training materials and guidebooks um, for each of those stakeholder groups in order to reduce some of the barriers to building solar projects on tribal land at all scales and um, mtera has just been amazing to work with and it's a really exciting project so i'll wrap up there and i'm happy to answer questions later thank you thanks um and lastly, we have Tim Willink, our Director of Tribal Programs at Grid Alternatives. Thank you, Tongshi. Thank you, NetRoots Nation. Uh, my name is Tim Willink. I'm Director of the National Tribal Program at Grid Alternatives. I'm originally from New Mexico on the Eastern Agency of the Navajo Nation from a small community called Pueblo Pintado. Um, I started in solar about 10 years ago um, here in Denver, where I currently live with my family. Um, and I was just looking for a career change. And, you know, uh, I, you know, looked at some of the opportunities that are available. I took a couple of classes um, and I applied and I started out as a $12 an hour installer. Um, and so I, you know, grew with the solar industry. Um, and it was a great time. We installed on homes and schools and all kinds of businesses and other entities. Um, and again, I would go back home um, where, you know, I always, you know, help herd sheep, you know, and haul water and chop wood and stuff for my family and always get a sunburn and feel like, why can't I do this? Why can't we do this back home? Um, and so this opportunity with Grid came up about five years ago where I was fortunate enough to be hired. Um, as director and I started out, you know, our program started out with about just me and another uh, uh, AmeriCorps. Uh, so we slowly built it up. Um, we've gotten more successful uh, in terms of installs and training folks incrementally uh, up until now. Um, but again, a grid, you know, our philosophy is we feel like uh, solar energy and renewable energy we should be available to everybody, even with communities who don't have resources. Um, so at GRID, we, with our tribal program, we work in California with some of our regional offices. We also work in the Southwest, uh, as Lozana mentioned, the Picaris Pueblo, but also in the Navajo Nation and other uh, indigenous nations in the Southwest, in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, we also have partnered with tribes uh, in the Great Plains in South Dakota and North Dakota and Montana. Um, and one of our biggest projects recently was the Spokane Nation uh, in the Northwest. So traveling all over, uh, you know, the United States into these amazing, amazing um, indigenous nations and lands, um, very, very diverse. Um, but a lot of times what we do at GRID is we, we introduce solar PV projects and then we begin to develop projects. A lot of times we start with a demonstration project or a smaller project um, because a lot of tribes are, you know, it's really in line with their tribes of how goals of reaching uh, energy sovereignty and gaining more control of their energy resources. Um, so we've worked, you know, since 2010, we've worked with, as Tansi mentioned, over 40 indigenous nations across the United States while installing close to six megawatts of solar PV. Um, we've completed over 600 installs, mainly single family residents, 
Um, and again, that's over 600 Native American families who now have clean solar uh, PV energy. Um, with that, we're not just a nonprofit that comes in and builds and leads. We deliberately recruit and offer hands-on training and incorporate training into the solar projects. We do some classroom work as well. And so when we go into these communities, a lot of times we offer this opportunity to, tri to um, tribal citizens and workers. A lot of times we're partnering with the tribal government, their housing authorities and some of their workers who may be working in construction and housing uh, to gain experience in solar PV and, and introducing them to potentially a, a career path. So since 2010, we've had close to six, 700 uh, tra trainees that identify as American Indian or Alaska Native. Uh, so that's really exciting. We have people uh, within our office who identify as American Indian, uh, Alaska Native, um, working with us. Um, and again, I want to uh, just take the opportunity to thank Lazana. Um, we had all of those services uh, and funding opportunities. You know, we've had a great partnership so far. We hope to keep it going. Um, not only with technical assistance expertise, but also with the funding opportunities. But again, getting back to the workforce development opportunities, you know, it's just really hands-on. We, we, you know, if people get up on the roof and we actually call this our classroom on the roof. Um, so uh, again, that's a little bit of our program. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, stop there and leave it, uh, turn it back over to Tongshi. Hey, thanks, Tim. Um, so I just wanted to kind of wrap it up and share some highlights from, from our speakers today. And then following the highlights, I will be uh, posing some questions to the panelists, um, just because I know they have a diverse background and expertise in, in certain areas, and then kind of their work in Indian country as well is very unique. Uh, but again, I am the director of the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund, and at the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund, we believe that community-based solutions for renewable energy um, that meet tribal needs are the result of the local leadership. So we really depend on, on the tribe's leadership to um, develop those, the plans and the priorities, and then the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund um, tries to support in any way that we can within the renewable energy development. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we really look for that philanthropic capital to uh, continue to support tribal energy projects um, that are, again, educational, entrepreneurial, and complete, re completely renewable. So um, just a couple highlights from the TSA. And then I think what stuck out to me with Lazana was that she has been working with, you know, within Indian country for, for many, many years and working to help uh, Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages um, reach their energy visions. And again, if you want more information, I, I encourage you to visit the um, energy.gov slash Indian energy website. Um, secondly was Dr. Suzanne uh, Singer, um, who has uh, co-founded Native Renewables. And, you know, she really um, did the work beforehand and met the needs of her own community and is now doing projects that are replicable in other communities. Uh, so really just appreciate her attend or being a panelist today. Um, again, she's invested in not only people, but indigenous people who um, continue to face, you know, challenges and barriers in, in development, but especially in renewable energy development. Uh, next, we had Dr. Karin Wasak, and she does um, a lot of great work, like Lozana has been in the work for over 25 years, um, and, you know, continues to work with tribes in the Southwest by you know, helping to plan and develop uh, utility scale tribal um, energy development. Um, so again, she highlighted a couple tribes that she works with, specifically Navajo Nation and the Hopi tribe, um, and, you know, looks forward to working with um, another three-year grant in the future. 
Um, and then lastly, we have Dr. Or, sorry, dang, I gave you a doctorate. We have Director Tim Willink of the National Tribal Program, um, who you know has worked in solar for a number of years and continues to build those relationships throughout Indian Country um, while serving his own tribe, the Navajo Nation, as best as he can. Um, so it's just really exciting to be among you know these these experts that um, have a passion and commitment to Indian Country. And with that, I would just like to call on each panelist and um, I'd like to pose a question to Dr. Susan Singer. Uh, just wanted to hear your thoughts on what the interconnections among the tribes, energy, independence, and traditional knowledge. So I was thinking of a story recently we had a we participated in a session for a virtual career fair with the community of Pinyon here in Navajo and we our, our session was called what's up you get it um, so as part of the activity we had participants pretending to be um, solar trackers so we had had them like grab a piece of paper and then sort of like if it's winter time what do you do if it's like summertime, how does that change? Um, so it was really neat it was the host that was helping out. He started thinking about, okay, when I'm thinking about when I go out in the morning and I pray to the east, I start to see the relation of the sun and the different seasons and it feels, I don't know, I, can't, I don't know if inherits the right word, it sort of was something that came natural to him and he understood very quickly. Um, but I think the other thing that's important to our team is to try to integrate some of our cultural knowledge and stories um, within our teachings. So one of the things that we put together was um, a coloring book um, that's both in Navajo and English and talks a little bit about the sun, um, the different seasons, the importance of the time of the day. And it mentions the hero twins who were given tools from their father, the sun, to overcome challenges. Um, but I think what's interesting, exciting about Native people is we all have our own stories and cultural teachings, and I'm sure a lot of those have to do with the sun. Um, in terms of energy independence, I think one of the things our executive director, Wahela Johns, likes to say is something to the effect of, if you control your power, you control your destiny. And I think energy independence for tribes can mean that they are less impacted by decisions of utility or rate makers. Um, they are more resilient against things like power outages that can impact their businesses or their critical infrastructure. On a residential scale, having reliable power source that maybe you've never had before gives you the freedom to have lighting at night. So you can be more productive if you want, or there's charging for laptops for students who need it for school, especially now in these crazy times. Um, or simply, you know, just they just want to watch an entire movie without their generator running out if they're using a generator. Um, and so some of the families we talk with, they, they get really excited when, so when there's a power outage, there's people that come by and say, how do you have electricity? And they are like, oh, well, I have solar. So I think it's kind of neat, a word of mouth thing that happens when there's, you know, the, when they're at the end of the line and something happens, they don't have power. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and another question, um, just from a grassroots native, you know, led nonprofit renewable energy organization. Um, how do you recommend tribes uh, begin the process of developing a renewable energy plan or program that meets the needs of their community? Um, in terms of, I think, just energy preparation to make a plan, tribes, what I think is important is, I'll say, accounting of their resources. Um, so thinking about what are the renewable energy options they have um, in terms of you know, it's critical for using solar energy to power some of your buildings, having an idea of what your electrical needs are or what needs your community has and how you address those. Um, so for example, if someone asked me, I would say get your utility bills if you have them um, for every month for the past year and start to understand those trends. Uh, in terms of policy, I think one thing that's interesting um, for Navajo, we're in three different states, so I, I'm not sure how we would move forward on this, but considering how you, if and how you want to align with renewable portfolio standards and implement those. 
Um, I think sometimes when we implement policy, like the intentions are there, but there are no metrics or goals or milestones to meet. So there's not, a, I don't know, teeth is the right word. So there's not a lot of teeth in them um, to implement them and, you know, keep yourself on track moving forward. Uh, for us, when partnering with organizations, we try to understand the other person's like values and vision and make sure that we are in alignment with that so that the project can, you know, move forward. And I think the last thing is one conversation we, we've had before is what is renewable energy and it could mean different things to different groups like hydropower. Some people consider it renewable and others don't. Um, and then I guess just lastly, you know, again, I'll say it again, is invest in your people and help them get the expertise to meet the, meet your needs and to move forward and build and grow. Thank you. Thanks. Um, those are all great responses. And I, I hope you all check out the uh, publication that she shared in the chat box, uh, the building blocks document. Um, so I'd like to call upon Tim um, to answer a question regarding um, his perspective on what the relationship between renewable energy and tribal energy sovereignty. What is the relationship? Great, thanks. Um, again, I'm just gonna, uh, I try and, you know, throw out this uh, fact is uh, according to the National Renewable Energy Labs, NREL, indigenous nations have 2% of the land base and 5% of the renewable energy potential. So again, there's a lot of um, potential there for tribes to, to develop renewable energy in, in various forms, as Suzanne mentioned. Um, again, right now, just to lay the framework, many tribes face high rates of energy burden. So again, a high percentage of their monthly income is for utility bills and energy costs. This is for a ton of different reasons, you know, um, you know energy efficiency issues, also, um, there's not a lot of infrastructure where we work a lot of times, especially like where it's colder. So we don't have natural gas pipelines all over that, that you know, you can just plug into. Uh, so our energy, you know, especially our heating bills uh, sources are very, very limited. You can go with a high cost of propane. So a lot of them have chosen, you know, to do electric heating. So that drives up the electric costs as well. Uh, so again, a high percentage of their monthly income is for utility bills and energy costs. Also, many indigenous nations are on the front lines of energy development. You know, again, going back to the Navajo Nation, for example, we've had all these issues you know, you know, with fossil fuel development. Um, we've, I think we've had a lot of firsts or a lot of big things that are not the greatest out there. You know, we've had the largest uranium spill uh, in the nation's history that no, nobody really talks about, Church Rock. We also have 500, over 500 abandoned uranium mines. Again, that's the legacy of the nuclear industry. Um, we also have right now currently a 2,500 square mile methane cloud over the four corners from fracking. Um, we also have a lot of the legacy of, of coal-fired power plants. And again, we, it's difficult because we derive, you know, a lot of our funding for our governmental services from these, these, these uh, industries. Um, but tribes, you know, again, especially at the local grassroots uh, level, um, they are also uh, looking... Um, to develop more, uh, go a different way. And so renewables is the other thing, uh, is the way they're, they're looking at, um, particularly solar in, in our instance. Um, another example is, again, is the money goes off the reservation. You know, again, you know, tribes will pay their utility bills off into utilities that are off the reservation. That money is just gone forever. It never re recirculates into our uh, local economy. And again, this hampers economic development efforts and job creation. So again, many indigenous nations are looking to break this cycle and gain more and more control over our energy costs and also explore more efficient forms of energy development without so many negative effects that linger that we have to clean up. And so again, one of this is renewable energy. Um, I was walking back home recently and we were working on a system. Um, and, you know, again, it's going to be on a local chapter house. Uh, where again, they will be get normally in years past, they've just gotten a lot of energy from the coal fired power plants from far away. But this is going to be distributed generation from a solar uh, panel, and it's all from the sun. And I was like, why are we digging up this ground when we can just have it from the sun, you know, being, being, um, and for years, for 25 to 30 years? Um, 
So again, you know, they're looking more and more. It's, it's hard because of the, the technical aspect of it. And so a lot of times we are the first to come in, you know, uh, to do a lot of, in, in this instance, a lot of grid tied solar. Um, you know, it's hard to talk about solar from Denver. It's easier, you know, to do a demonstration project, believe it or not, and then have them monitor their bills and see the cost savings firsthand. And then it's built from there. It's like, hey, you know, we didn't get it. Our bill was $4 last month. And we can use that savings for vital services in other ways instead of just paying our utility bills. Um, these are just some examples. Um, and again, you know, to me, that this means gaining more control and on a local level, uh, having more say in your development, having more say in seeing your, you know, tribal citizens and people that, that want to work and have skill sets that want to develop their skill sets um, to, to install. Uh, these systems and a lot, again, solar is not no no maintenance. It's low maintenance, so it's just sitting there with the drip, drip, drip of the electrons, uh, and again, just powering up all the the, the thing the the their loads. Um, so again, I think that that's really working towards energies. All of it's really energy uh, sovereignty. But to me, we just did a, a big project out on Spokane, and we have photos on our website and our Instagram of you know, people working on the roof, and these are all local folks uh, from the communities. And that to me, you know, it's the solar putting it up and, and, and developing these and the cost savings. But to me, real energy sovereignty, as Suzanne mentioned, is, is uh, educating our people, uh, to help, helping them develop their skill sets and seeing this as a potential career path. Again, a lot of folks, they like to work with their hands. You can work outside, but you can also gain a skill set that's very technical and you can use your brain, you know, to, to do a lot of this work. It's not just the same old, same old. So it's, it's incredibly fun. And again, as we gain more and more control, you know, it's something that is not always a worry. We can start addressing other issues and, and do more projects. And again, just one other thing is solar is really diverse. You know, again, we have off, small off-grid systems. We can do street lighting with solar. We can do grid-tied homes. We can do solar fields. We can do commercial buildings. So again, it's all in the mix and many tribes are looking at according to their, their particular needs. And so it's really, really exciting. Um, you know, we can also do, you know, offset just direct energy costs, uh, but we can also potentially be selling off res as a sole force of, source of revenue. Instead of getting that revenue from these coal fired power plants or other things, we can get it, uh, sell the utility eventually. So we're all working on that. So that's my, my thoughts on uh, energy sovereignty moving forward. Awesome, thank you. That's great to hear perspectives, you know, from a, a tribal perspective. And that's kind of what we were addressing today is that um, tribes have the potential, of course, to develop their own renewable energy, um, which will, you know, lead them to be energy resilient and eventually energy sovereign. Um, so that wraps up our presentation for today. We did have a couple more questions, but we want to respect everybody's time and, and you know, at that uh, minute 50 mark. So um, if we have any outstanding questions that you'd like to ask, we're happy to answer. Hey, um, Tom Chi, I yeah. think we still, we still have a little bit more time. I think. Yeah, that's what I just seen. We do oh, actually sorry. have about nine minutes, so we can keep going. I mean, we have a lot of great panelists that have a lot of good perspective. So I did have a couple more questions, so we'll just keep it going because I would like to hear uh, a, the perspective from a federal agency. So we got a perspective from a native-led nonprofit, but I'd like to ask Lazana Pierce um, from the DOE Indian Energy perspective. How do you recommend tribes begin the process of developing renewable energy projects? that meet the needs of their tribe? Um, I, think, <clears throat> I think Suzanne hit on a bunch of the items um, as far as knowing what your energy costs are, as well as where you wanna be in the future. Um, so I won't go over that, but I will say that we do have, um, through our office, technical assistance also through the Department of Interior's Division of Energy and Minerals. Uh, they have technical assistance to, to help or facilitate that dialogue. Um, but obviously, I think it's, it's creating where does the tribe want to be? Um, 
in having the information or reaching out to others um, on this panel and, and elsewhere that can help you know, provide information for you for, for tribes to make informed decisions. Awesome, thanks. And then kind of a follow up to that. Um, how do you foresee tribes planning and developing renewable energy projects in the next five to 10 years? Um, I've seen, we've seen um, a lot of interest in solar energy um, from tribes across the nation. In fact, a couple examples I gave uh, for Alaska as well, above the Arctic Circle. Um, I see a lot of focus and, and you know, predict my tea leaves that um, there's, a, there's gonna be increased interest by tribes in microgrids um, for energy independence, whether it be tsunamis on the coast, being turned off for fire hazards, um, reliance on utilities, things like that. So I really believe, and I've seen that there's there's a huge interest that I think it will increase in, in microgrids. Having the ability locally to control your energy um, enables economic development, it, it powers your businesses, you know, powers medical facilities, um, and so forth. So I see sort of microgrids, um, especially for those that are at the end of the line, first off, last back on, you know, reliability has a lot to do with the economics and business as well. Um, so again, I think, I think microgrids um, are going to increase in interest to, to provide that sort of local energy independence, sovereignty, if you will. Thanks, Lozana. Um, and I don't want to forget about Dr. Karin Wasak. Um, so I do have a question for her and I'd like to know, uh, what are the types and scale of renewable energy projects tribes are planning and developing for right now? Thank you. Uh, when I speak, I'll circle this back to the topic of sovereignty since that's the, you know, the pillar of this panel. Um, when I speak with tribal staff members or tribal utility directors, the themes that come up repeatedly when you're talking about sovereignty are self-sufficiency of energy production for utilization, and then the opportunity that renewable energy development offers for self-sufficiency of finances. And both Suzanne and Tim highlighted this from different angles. So, um, you know, Tim talked about the history of extraction and, the fact that tribes can be reliant on revenue sources for providing government services. And we're seeing a trend where um, tribal governments are very interested in moving forward with utility scale renewable energy projects or other energy projects in order to diversify the sources of revenue and expand the revenue coming in so that the tribes can make their own decisions about what to do with that funding and how best to provide services as a government. And I think just to um, echo what Lizana said, I think there's a huge opportunity in the energy storage and microgrid space. I think that we'll see over the next 10 years, um, tribes, that maybe don't have the land base or the interest in solar or don't have um, the resource for wind or hydro or some other technology, nevertheless being able to participate in decarbonization and the clean energy economy because they have an interest in doing a standalone storage project that can um, generate revenue and contribute to grid stability as the entire power system moves toward a lower carbon future. And I think another trend I would identify that we see across the world is moving from giant central power plants and you know huge power lines to a much larger number of relatively smaller generating stations and you know the vast majority of those will probably be renewable and to me that just naturally opens the door for participants in more rural areas participants um, that don't necessarily have a huge land base and you know to me that is definitely an opportunity for tribes and I think that tribal governments, tribal economic development directors and tribal staff are definitely looking at those opportunities and sorting out what is a priority, whether it is that self-sufficiency and generating power for their own use um, or whether it is revenue generation and participating in the larger clean energy economy. And when 
a tribal enterprise um, or large user such as a government building or health facility or school is able to generate their own electricity um, and have battery backup that touches on what both Tim and Lazana mentioned of um, reducing your costs and having greater reliability. And so I think you're, we're seeing a lot of projects moving forward. You know, that's a lot of different scales, right? So utility scale for revenue, a lot of opportunities there, and then a facility scale for cost savings or electric reliability. And then obviously at the very small distributed scale for folks who don't even have power right now, being able to um, develop systems so that they have access to electricity and um, all of the other opportunities that provides. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we have two minutes, but I think we'll end now because we heard you know, from each of our panelists and, and their great perspectives and experience in uh, developing renewable energy, but specifically in indigenous communities across the nation. Um, so we'd like to thank you for attending our presentation today. And I hope you um, learned just a little bit, um, if you didn't already know about, you know, the, the unique needs in, in Indian country and across indigenous communities. Uh, we did share a number of links, so I hope you were able to uh, get those as well. But um, you'll, you know, you can reach out to any one of us. Again, I'm Tungshi Claremont from Grid Alternatives. We had Lizana Pierce from the DOE Indian Energy Office, Tim Willink from Grid Alternatives, uh, Dr. Karin Wasik from National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and Dr. Suzanne Singer from Native Renewables. So I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.